Ta-da. Okay. Hello, hello. Welcome to this episode of Food for Thought Friday. To date, we will be sharing some information on insulin resistance, how it impacts the body, and some action steps you can take to help restore balance within your body. I'm Haley Loy Roby of Holistically Haley. I'm a collector of plants who loves to walk barefoot in nature and enjoys daily breath work and meditation. I also listen to far too many educational podcasts and share my passion for nutrition with all that will listen or has ears. I'm a functional nutritional therapy practitioner certified by the NTA, a supplement specialist and restart instructor. I support clients without a gallbladder as well as individuals who are trying to avoid gallbladder surgery. I'm on a mission to educate the masses that the gallbladder has a function, it serves a purpose, and if removed, the loss of its function can have a negative impact on overall health. So instead of masking chronic symptoms, I take a bio-individual approach that supports the foundations to provide the body with the nutrients it needs in order for it to find balance so it can begin to heal itself. I'm so happy to be here today with one of my favorite colleagues, Mary. Mary, please introduce yourself. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mary, owner of I Deserve Health. I am a lover of books as well and research, and I always ask why, no matter how many people that might annoy <laughs> ever since I was little. I also love photography and capturing moments for families and my family that can be enjoyed for many, many years. And back to why we are all here. So I know how exhausted and overwhelmed you might be feeling after the birth of my children. I have five. I realized that my doctors couldn't provide the solutions I needed to keep myself and my family healthy. My children unfortunately struggled with sensory processing issues and also GI issues as well. I have dealt with mysterious fatigue, brain fog, autoimmune conditions since childhood. So I felt drained and helpless. No one had an explanation that made sense, or they just gave me names for the diseases that I had without any re like true causes for the root cause. So I was determined to solve my family's health problems. Um, and I built on my work as a graduate level science educator and began studying nutrition. Fast forward about 10 years, now I'm a functional nutritionist and I finally have answers. There's an explanation for why you feel so tired and it is not your fault. The good news is that there are solutions. It is time to get back to your family, to doing the things that you love. And my goal as a holistic practitioner, I think in terms of optimal function, we work from the inside out, looking for underlying imbalances. Um, imbalances manifest as symptoms, which if left unchecked can develop into disease. So my goal is to find the root cause of poor health and dysfunction and restore balance in the body that could lead to optimal function and better quality of life. Before we begin, just a reminder that this presentation is for educational purposes for purposes only. It is not intended to diagnose, treat, or mitigate disease. Please consult your healthcare professional about new, any new dietary choices or supplements that may interact with your medications. So today our topic is insulin resistance. So why should we focus on insulin resistance? These are some of the symptoms that might show up. Some of them, not all of them, maybe all of them, maybe just one. Um, sometimes we, some people develop darkened skin in the armpit or on the back and sides of the neck. Some people might have blood pressure more than 130 over 80. Some people feel, get shaky and weak if a meal is skipped. Some people feel like they're just dragging through the day or they just eat a lot of sugar. Some people have no symptoms. Some people snack all day. Some people eat a lot of chips, pasta, and other refined carbs. So these are things we're going to discuss in our talk. So in our other video, we spoke about how we spoke about, we spoke about blood sugar regulation um, and how it works. Basically having a proper balance of blood sugar levels is one of the body's top priorities. The body will do whatever is necessary to get blood sugar back into balance. And it also comes before almost all other biological functions. So to break down the words that we use, we're talking about insulin resistance. Resistant is another word for adapting. Adapting is survival and true for all biological systems. So let's explain that just a tiny bit. I'm gonna go into this really quickly and then we'll move on. 
So a literal biological definition of resistance is the capacity of bacteria to withstand the harmful effects of a chem I'm sorry, of a harmful chemical agent. So exposure to something creates resistance. So if you think about like if you've I'm sure everyone's heard of antibiotic resistance superbugs. Um, so being in like a hospital setting all the time, or if you're always taking antibiotics over and over again, certain bacteria develop resistance to antibiotics. There's also drug resistance. Your body creates less cell receptors. Like when you're having too much coffee over and over, you need more and more coffee to have the same effect than when you first had it or other drugs. I'm sure we can all come up with different drugs in our head of why of drugs that we need more and more of to have the same effect of when we first tried it. Also think about um, another example that's not related to this. Parents who constantly yell at kids, eventually they get ignored because kids become resistant to the yelling. So it all functions under similar ways. So what is insulin resistance? So prolonged excessive exposure to this hormone, which is insulin, can lead into something called hyperinsulin, here we go, <laughs> hyperinsulinemia, which causes insulin resistance. Uh, in one study, they did a 40 hour constant insulin infusion into a group of healthy young people. So they just basically hooked them up to an IV and for 40 hours, they kept dripping insulin into their blood. And they noticed that their insulin resistance uh, increased by 15%. And that's from the book uh, called Diabetes Book by Dr. Fung, F-U-N-G. So basically, the higher the insulin dose, the more insulin resistance they developed. Blood glucose got better, but diabetes got worse. And we'll go into this in a minute. So for resistance to develop, two things are required, high hormone levels of the insulin and also a constant stimulus, constant snacking. Normally, insulin is released in bursts, preventing insulin resistance from developing, leading to a vicious cycle when one is constantly simulating the release of insulin. So think of snacking constantly all the time, a high carb diet, lots of artificial sweeteners are constantly making our pancreas send out insulin. So when constant high levels of insulin yell for the glucose to enter the cells, it has to progress. It has a progressively less effect, like we spoke about the resistance. Um, so the knee-jerk reaction of the body is to produce more insulin, which is hyperinsulinemia. Insulin. <laughs> I should have practiced this. Hyperinsulinemia, which is the cause of obesity and diabetes. So the cycle continues around and around. Insulin is extremely high, which drives weight gain and other and obesity. The longer the cycles continue, the worse it becomes. Our job, which I'm sure many of us would like to do, would love to do, is break that cycle. People, unfortunately, can be stuck in the cycle for decades. It usually starts at a very young age, sometimes, you know, constantly snacking all day, especially on high sugary snacks. If you think of all the snacks that are given to our kids, fruit roll-ups, gummies, applesauce pouches, juices, etc., um, this is not meant to be a guilt trip. It's just information that we cannot use to make educated choices. So to explain as like an analogy, the way insulin works, picture a subway station, picture, imagine that the train is your cells and the conductor of the train is insulin. And then the passengers that are getting on and off are glucose, which is sugar. So the train stops at a station gets the all clear signal from the conductor, which is the insulin, the doors open and lets the passengers, the glucose, enter the train. Now picture a subway train at rush hour. This is when we're eating that really, you know, that yummy tasting cake, that bag of chips, that, you know, 32 ounce juice. Um, a full train is entering the station. So this is a train, a cell that has is full of glucose already. And the platform is also full of passengers. The conductor sends a signal to open the door, but there is no space because it is full. So another little tidbit of information. In the 1920s in New York City, subway pushers were hired to forcibly shove people into packed trains. This still happens in Japan. When passengers are left standing on the platform, passenger arrangement staff, that's what they're called, push more people into the train. So more glucose is getting pushed into the train. Hyperinsulinemia is the body's subway pusher. It shoves glucose into already stuffed cells. When whatever glucose or passengers are left outside of the cells, guess what the body produces? 
Can you guess? <laughs> Just asking to make sure people are still awake. The body produces extra insulin to forcibly push more glucose into the cell, the subway pushers. This vicious cycle goes around and around. And what happens now is the cell produces as much new fat, the cab, and I, I call these the cab drivers because people are so tired of waiting, they'll go upstairs and take cabs. That's the fat that's being produced as possible. So the cell produces as much new fat as possible to relieve the internal congestion of glucose. If more new fat is created than can be exported, fat backs up in the liver, which leads to something called fatty liver. So excessive glucose and insulin drives new fat production. This occurs faster than the liver can export it out of the fat cells. Fat will then accumulate in the liver. And if you want to learn more about this, the book, The Diabetes Code by Dr. Jason Fung is a great resource for all of this. Haley. <laughs> I must unmute myself to talk. So <laughs> how does insulin resistant impact your health? Well, there's consequences of insulin resistance, starting with high blood glucose. So when, when uh, you eat a meal, especially one rich in carbohydrates, your blood glucose levels rise and the pancreas releases insulin to help cells absorb this glucose. However, when the cells in your muscles, fat and liver don't respond well to insulin due to insulin resistance and can't easily take up glucose from your body, the glucose has nowhere to go per se and leads to high blood sugar glucose levels. Um, when the blood glucose is high and insulin isn't being utilized effectively to help uptake the glucose from the blood, insulin resistance can also lead to high insulin, kind of what Mary was saying previously with the subway pushers. I know this is a vicious cycle, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. So think of it this way. When the insulin resistance occurs, the key or insulin doesn't fit the lock insulin receptors on the cell surface as well as it should. As a result, the glucose is not effic if efficiently taken up by the cells, even though there's plenty of insulin in the blood, it is, <clears throat> excuse me, it is as if there's not enough because it's not doing its job effectively. So the pancreas senses the glucose is not being taken up by the cells and responds by producing even more insulin, leading to high levels of insulin in the blood and the condition known as hyperinsulinemia. I'm saying everything that Mary's saying just in a little different way. So. Um, when there's insulin resistance, the pancreas produces more insulin to compensate. Over time, this leads to a pancreas, pancreas becoming exhausted. Chronic overproduction of insulin can lead to beta cells dysfunction and eventually a decrease in the ability to produce insulin. When the pancreas can no longer produce enough insulin, blood glucose levels can become persistently elevated. Without sufficient insulin, the body cannot regulate blood sugar effectively um, leading to the chronic high blood sugar levels, um, levels characteristic of diabetes. And just one, the beta cells, what are they? The beta cells is where the insulin is produced inside of the pancreas. Thank you. So another consequence of insulin resistance is imbalanced hormones. Insulin resistance is a complex condition that can disrupt the delicate balance of hormones in the body from sex hormones to stress hormones and even hormones regulating hunger. Um, that impact is widespread. Mm -hmm. Even like PCOS and other yeah. issues that a lot of females face, young females too, like the I don't have the exact number, but I know PCS is really common, especially in younger teens now more than ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and then lastly, metabolic syndrome. So the cycle continues with the body becoming more and more resistant to insulin. The pancreas produces more insulin and blood glucose levels rising higher and higher. Over time, this can lead to metabolic syndrome, which are a group of conditions that together raise your risk of heart disease and stroke, type two diabetes, liver and kidney disease, and other health issues such as sleep apnea, reproductive problems, and certain cancers. According to the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, metabolic syndrome is also called insulin resistance syndrome. Oop. But there's good news. <laughs> now that we just totally made you feel terrible. <laughs> There is some hope here. So if you're ex exhibiting symptoms of insulin resistance, you can restore balance within your body, but it takes intention and effort. So how can we restore balance? You can um, incorporate nutrient dense, properly prepared foods into your diet. 
therefore reducing overly or ultra processed foods, um, maybe you need to supplement. Um, try our sugar detox, our 21 day, or excuse me, is it 21 day restart? Five week, five week restart. Five week. Right, five weeks with the 21 day detox. That's what I yes, was thinking. Built in. <laughs> built into it. And um, increased physical activity and sleep. Everyone needs more sleep. So, I mean, I would choose one, pick one. What, what, what can you change? Um, I think incorporating nutrient dense foods in your diet is one of the first steps that you can take into addressing um, or into restoring balance which we have a video on food swaps on our YouTube channel. Yes. So as Haley said, it does take intention and effort. We would love for you to take charge of your health. We're here as guides along the process, but it's really you that has, that has to make that decision, that conscious decision and effort to do that. So I hope this video can help you understand better of why it's really important to make a conscious decision, especially with the foods that we're eating, because now that you understand the way sugar impacts your entire health, it's really great to take the next step. So first decide, why do you want to do this? Do you want more energy so you can truly enjoy the gift of life that we have? Do you want to be more present with your friends and family? Maybe you've been experiencing brain fog and lower cognition and haven't associated that with insulin resistance until this moment. If you have these symptoms, um, have these symptoms been affecting your quality of life and productivity? So taking charge of your health, only you have the power to do this, no one else but you. So we can help uh, watch our other free videos that we have, that we have posted on YouTube, work with one of us. If you want more like one-on-one -on -one help, or if you want to join one of our groups when we run our restart or any of our other educational groups that we're running, but reach out to us, feel free to ask us any questions, comment below um, on our Facebook page, send us a message, send us an email. This is how you can reach us. We can help you. We create the plan together and you implement it and reap all the benefits, not only you, but your family, your generations to come, everyone around you, everyone gets the benefits of this. So we have been trained and have the experience to show you how you can restore balance to your body. We also can interpret blood lab markers from a nutritional point of view and prevent many things before they even start. So if you're curious, if your lab markers are showing things that maybe haven't picked up by conventional methods, we're here to help you. Just to reiterate, we don't diagnose, treat, or cure, but we sure as heck can come alongside you and give you the tools you need to set yourself on a different traje trajectory. <laughs> Absolutely. Well... Thank you again, everyone, for attending or watching this video. And um, if you have a question, as Mary said, drop those in the comments. Or you know what? Let us know if you learned something new. What what were you most surprised by? And uh, all right. Well, again, Wait, we didn't do a challenge this time. I oh yeah, I didn't do a challenge. <laughs> oh man, put me on the spot. What can we do? <laughs> um, well. Let's see. Um, I challenge, I, I want, I, I challenge everyone to make an effort to um, create a sleep routine where they are stepping away from their devices at least an hour before bed. I know, Ooh, it's hard. I know it's yeah. hard. It is hard for me, but you know what? It helps get us in this, a, a different state where we're relaxed and our body is ready to wind down. So, you know what? Sleep is one of the things that we need to um, be mindful of when we addressing or we're trying to restore balance. So, hey, that's just one simple thing that you can do is set down your phone, turn off the TV, you know, and just create a sleep routine. So that's the challenge. Thank you for reminding me about that. Mary. Yeah. And also watch our video on food swaps. If you need some ideas on what you can switch out as a healthy alternative. Um, and if you, and I say, sugar. huh? The balancing blood sugar one. Yes. Yeah, so I was about to say that. Watch the balancing <laughs> blood sugar one. Definitely. Like I like to just set up a, um, on a queue. So when I'm driving like to places, whether I have like a 15 minute drive or a 30 minute drive, or even on my walks, I put on my, my ear, whatever. And I listen to these talks because, you know, you could do more than one thing at a time. Usually. I mean, if it's, if what you have to do involves thinking, then obviously, 
But if you'd like to just drive and listen to stuff, watch all of our videos, get educated. And if you really want to work with one of us, feel free to reach out. And um, there was something I had this book here. I don't I don't know why <laughs> I was going to show it during it. But the big fat surprise, I don't know why I put it out. I think because we were going to talk about I think I mentioned something about oh, I didn't mention it. It was earlier. <laughs> That's another episode for another time. <laughs> but also, okay. I, um, you know, another thing before we wrap this up is if you have a topic that you're interested in learning more about, you know, drop drop it in the comments, email either Mary or I, and um, we'll look into creating the video because we want this to be um, information that you're looking for, right? So we can only help you if you let us know what you're looking for. So with that said, I'm Haley with Holistically Haley. Ooh. I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't read that. I forgot to read this one thing. It's really interesting. Then I, I had put it in the notes, but I forgot to read it. I'll just say it really quickly. Um, in 1977, the dietary guidelines for Americans strongly advised people eat less fat and more carbohydrates, such as bread and pasta. And what was the result of that? Dramatically increased insulin levels. So it's not a coincidence. A lot of other diseases began to go up when they recommend it to eat less fat. So refined carbohydrates causes much more drastic spike in insulin than fat does. High carbohydrate intake can increase liver fat production tenfold while high, high fat consumption with correspondingly low carbohydrate intake does not change liver fat production noticeably. But that's why I put this here because if you want to learn more about how we were lied to about fats and how they created a fat phobia amongst many of our parents, please read this book or get it on audiobook. It's a lot to read, but I, I listened to the whole thing on audiobook and it was so informative. I was a little bit upset while hearing a lot of the, the information in here because she did it. Well, she did a really good job. She was a, um, she worked for the newspapers, right? Like she's an, a reporter. So she's like an investigative journalist and she gets all the data, all the facts, all the studies this is worth a read or worth a listen to because fat is our friend. It is not our enemy. And we do have a video on good fat versus bad fat. So watch that too. The end. <laughs> Wait, do you want me to do my sign out one more time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. All right. So, you, and you all know that we don't edit our videos. So <laughs> for the third time, um, thank you again for watching our video. My name is Haley Loy Roby. I'm with Holistically Haley. You can reach me at my website. Um, <laughs> oh my gosh, I can't think of my website. It's on the screen. It's on the screen. <laughs> I, I know I can't see it. Um, <laughs> with nourishtherootcause.com, or you can email me at hello at nourishtherootcause.com. Follow me on Facebook and um, Instagram with the same handle. So thanks again. Mary, I had a great time. Yes, me too. And you know, my name is Mary San Rosales and you can find me at ideservehealth.com. Instagram is i.deserve.health on Instagram. And I'm mostly active on there, but I'm also on Facebook and you can email me at mary at ideservehealth.com. Have a great day or night, wherever you are. <laughs>